my presentation today is entitled Connect, Communicate, and Collaborate. And um, it's non traditional strategies for researching family history. And the emphasis is on collaborating with people and institutions that are long distance from you. So this is filling out and fleshing out your ancestors' stories, not just having birth, marriage, death, burial records. Here we go. My objectives for today are to identify paths to connect with other people or organizations that may have information, skills, or interest in your research. And these paths can be found on large online family history sites, social media, websites, newspaper articles, blogs, and so on. Secondly, we'll explore the available tubes, tools, and techniques to successfully communicate with other researchers. And these are almost unlimited because most of these sources have links to email or phone or other resources to connect with the other people and entities. And third, we'll exam examine examples of how collaboration with others can result in remarkable discoveries. So I have a lot of examples and it's often possible to locate published genealogies, histories, vital records, documents, photos, and maps, other resources that other family historians have already researched and analyzed, saving you time, effort, and money. And we will begin today by exploring some of the features available on Family Search, beginning with the person page on the shared family tree. <clears throat> Like many of you, I have a love-hate relationship with the shared tree. Yes, I know, it's not always accurate, and anyone can edit or change things that are on the tree. It's the largest family tree on the planet. So, so there's a lot there, and it has several features which may reveal back valuable hints or documents relevant to your research. Um, and my handout has links to all of these places. So uh, if you look in your, it's called a handbook on the ID page, you can, you can see these. We'll explore how this link of tabs on the toolbar of the person page in the shared tree can be used to locate documents and photos containing your ancestors, and how you can also use the same tabs to post your own information. To begin, you need to create a um, an account or sign into your account at Family Search. And then from the toolbar at the top, you would click on search and then go to the family tree. After you click on that, you'll have search boxes available. And in this case, I was doing research for another member of our society. I just put in his name and the day he was born. And Lucky for me, he magically appeared mm -hmm. in the list of resources. And the tree doesn't contain a person page for every deceased person, but it is worth your time to search because there are 1.2 billion names on the site. So you select the correct person from the list of results, or if you don't see the correct person, you can note that you could look for close ancestors or uh, family members, you might have a spelling error or spelling variations. You might have to look at different spellings and might have to change the dates. But if, if you can't find them at all, they might not be on there, but chances are they're in there somewhere if you keep looking. Uh, maybe co uh, connect with a close relative, like a parent or a child, and you can find them, hopefully. Then notice the list of tabs at the um, top in the toolbar for the person page. It displays a summary of all known biographical and genealogical information about this one person. These pages are a wealth of collaborative knowledge for a person's descendants. There's a new version of this page which has the same features in a different format and it's currently being offered on a trial basis. So you can toggle back and forth between the two types. It's just a different display that they're trying. Then there are a lot of different tabs across here. The details will tell you the birth, marriage, death, burial, that sort of thing, and the immediate family, your parents and children. 
The timeline will give you a list of dates and places for anything that is entered in the person's or attached to the person's profile page here. Sources is a list of those uh, documents. Collaborate is a place where other members can write notes or ask questions. And memories is a place where documents from offsite can be placed on here, like photographs or something like that. You can also click on the view tree and see this person in the shared family tree. You can follow them, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And you can view your relationship if you have put yourself in the shared tree. If you did put yourself in the shared tree, no one can see you except you if you're a living person or you want to keep from showing people, you just don't put a death date by them, just like on Ancestry. Um, you can also look at the research help. In this case, they say there might be a possible living a missing child because there's a big gap in the dates between births of children. It might say there's a duplicate or other, just red flags basically. And then search records is a place that's sort of like hints. You can go down here and click on any of these different um, links and it'll take you to records that might be possibly available for that person. Someone wants you. So we're gonna look at sources first because that's probably the most important list that you'll see. The sources display a list of documents which have been attached to the person. So this, um, whatever is available there is dependent on what's been attached to the person by other people. And there, a lot of people have a lot of stuff, some people don't have much, but it's worth a try. So if you click on the link to the left of any of those sources, you will see a digital copy of the source, a citation, the name of the contributor, the date it was added, and any similar records after you click on it. Notice here that Jasper's first source is his Civil War pension application file, which was posted by Janice Stokes on January 5th, 2020. Also notice that a Civil War pension file ap application file from NARA usually costs $80 for the first 100 pages, then it's 70 cents for each additional page. And this file has 140 pages, which would cost $122 and it's free here. <laughs> That's just a gold mine. I, I just happened to fall upon that, but this has pages 71 through 140 and the other pages are farther down. And the very first page mm -hmm. of Jasper's declaration for an original Civil War invalid pension contains a trove of firsthand personal information about him. We see his name, age, places of residence, enlistment and discharge from the Union Army, personal description, visibility incurred in service, his occupation and his signature, and there are 139 more pages. <laughs> so if two lessons here, you might find something really, really interesting and you might not, it's worth looking. Also, if you do want a pension file, go to the National Archives and pay the money for them because they are worth it. <laughs> And uh, we noticed this source was created by Janet Stokes. Um, you can click on any contributor's name and you can view the relationship of that person to you, or you can send them an email message through this portal, or you can send it just by typing the, mess the email address into your own browser or your email. It's a great place to troll for cousins or other relatives. Um, the research notes under the Collaborate tab were also contributed by Jana. And so is the live sketch. And you can also put a live sketch in, which is kind of like a bite-sized biography. Those are just something that you can post either by typing in that space, or you can copy and paste and put that in. If you do that, um, or any of these things that you attach, they kind of are cousin bait where other people may look for the same person and that way you can connect with people that might have done some research or have pictures or whatever that would be valuable to you. Documents, photos, or audio files can be posted under the Memories tab. In this case, 21 documents are posted in this section for my third great grandfather, Rufus Crisp's person page. These include his marriage record, his pension file affidavits, 
Civil War enlistment cards, and more. You can add memories too. So if you'd like to put in pictures or documents, or if you even want to do an audio file, you can do that and post it here. And it's going to be there forever. So um, I think Ancestry will be there forever, but we don't really know that. But it's a pretty sure thing that Family Search will be there forever because it's the largest online service for records and family trees in the world. You can also follow this person, which means if you click on this little star, it will turn to following. And anytime there's a change to that person's information or a document is added or anything like that, you'll get a notification. And I think you can adjust the frequency of the notification. I get mine about once a week. It tells me, I just click on everybody. <laughs> and then if anybody has a change, I get a notice because new stuff gets posted every once in a while. Family Search is also another place to look for digital online publications. The book section contains online books, including county histories, church histories, and records, published family genealogies, published archives, like the books from the Pennsylvania Archives, genealogy quarterlies and magazines, and many more. Again, to find this, you would need to log in at the upper right and then click on search. But this time, rather than going to the family tree, we would go down to books to find them. Again, you get a search field. I put in Kirchner family here, which is uh, one of my family surnames, but you could also put in a location, like a county and state, or you could put in a topic if you wanted to research a certain type of um, event in history, for example. And you get a list of books that might be cataloged with that as a keyword in the topic uh, or in the title or inside the book. So here I have the history of the Kirshner family. It's my first result. If you don't get a um, tip that you think is relevant at the beginning, then you can go over on the left and refine the criteria for your search. So you can put uh, dates or subjects or whatever you would like to do over there to kind of refine that down. And then click on the title of the book or down where it says full text results so that you can read the book. If the little access level above is public access, you're able to read that from home and look at it immediately. And you can also download or print pages as you're going and reading. Okay. Uh, for example, this book is, sorry. It's a 94 page genealogy of the Kirshner family beginning with my seventh great grandfather, Johannes Kirshner. It was written in 1940 by one of his descendants who had visited all the family farms with his father when he was a child. It contains a wealth of information about the family, their land ownership, dwellings, church, military service, and family lore. Other types of books can be found in the catalog from the homepage menu. So you can Again, go to the search, but this time, instead of doing family tree or books, we can do catalog. And again, search by several different types of descriptives. You can either search by place or surname, titles, author, subjects, or keywords. So in this case, I was looking for a book about Haynes Church, St. John's Haynes Reformed Church. So I typed those words in and I found a list of 15 results that talk about St. John's Haynes Church. And if you want to limit it to only ones that you can see online rather than books that would be filed in the Family History Library in Utah, you could check this instead of any. And um, the very first one is the one I was interested in. It's a 1935 history of Haynes Church that contains biographies of a number of families that were. Uh, original founders of the church. This one, however, is restricted access. 
If you see the camera and the key, all that means is that you can't see that from home, but if you come here or to the Topeka Genealogical Society Library, you can access those books by getting on the online web at that or the internet service at the location that you're at. Every once in a while, you have to go to an actual family history center, but most of them you can do at a um, library like this. So anyway, this book was the newest of three books on the church history. There's an original and two supplements. And this is the second one. <clears throat> and just to give you an idea of what's in here, this book contains the genealogy of several families who attended Haynes in the early 1700s. This Lurch family chapter begins with my sixth great-grandfather, Casper Lurch. He came from Germany in 1738 and has there's several generations of the family listed in the book. <clears throat> and we'll move on to one more family search feature. You can search the genealogies, and those aren't my favorite because they're just like the trees on ancestry. They may be right, they may not be, but if we read this, it says Family Search Genealogies is a large directory of family trees, also known as lineages or pedigrees, that people or organizations have shared with Family Search. We organize the information into collections and then make it available for you to search. So you can search by surname and you'll get a whole list usually of family trees that go with that surname. You may have to be more specific, obviously, if you have a common name, but again, these are just places to look. If you look, and as many places as you can, you'll get some more information, I guarantee you. Another fun place to look for information is on blogs. Um, here's some examples to get you started. You can find blogs by searching for names or topics on Google from a list of, or from a list of blogs on genealogy topics. And I've got a list of 100 on your handout. Uh, well, it's a link to a list. <laughs> <laughs> And you can subscribe to bloggers who give genealogy tips or search your surname or follow bloggers that write about history or places near your family's hometown or county or city. And after you subscribe or follow a blogger, blogger you'll receive notice when a new post is published. Every blog can be searched for surnames, locations, etc., from a, a search box on the home page. So we'll look at some of those features. I follow the Legal Genealog Genealogist blog by Judy Russell, and she gives tips for finding US invention patents in two new databases added to Ancestry in December 2021. And actually, she does almost a weekly blog and covers all kinds of topics. A lot of it's about law and how that affects genealogy, but it's a lot of different topics. And I knew my great-grandfather, uh, great-great-grandfather Thomas Jefferson Hathaway had been issued a patent for a well drilling machine, but I read he was issued another one that I couldn't find. So sure enough, when I saw this, I searched those new Ancestry databases and found his seed planter patent from 1893 in the Ancestry collections, just like that. <laughs> and it's one page of several describing his gizmo here and has his name and the people who are witnesses to his filing this patent with the patent office. I also follow Roots and Branches, which is James Byler's blog. He's an expert in Pennsylvania German research and is my sixth cousin. He occasionally shares new information about our mutual ancestors. So here he writes about my fifth great grandfather, Johann Joost Easter, who emigrated from Elshoff, Germany, Germany. 1737. And here he shares that Johann Joost was a Dutch soldier in 1737 before he came to America. I would never have found that. <laughs> he does a lot of researching overseas too. So um, find someone who, who blogs about your family. <laughs> I found an invitation on Ancestry.com to read Lynn Fenwin's blog, which covers her research into Isaac Werner, my first cousin, four times removed. He homesteaded in Stafford County, Kansas in the mid-1870s. Fenwin wrote a book about Isaac based on his 490-page journal, which he kept as a record of his daily life for many years. 
Here's an example of one of Lynn's posts about Isaac's family. So Isaac's grandfather was my fourth great grandfather. So through correspondence with Lynn, I was able to meet a living Werner cousin from Pennsylvania last summer. And we went to Isaac's gravesite and enjoyed time together. And I also got to talk to, this is Jim, Jim Werner, got to talk to his 94 year old parents in Wernersville, Pennsylvania. And they knew, they helped provide some of the information for the book on the thin lips as well. Another thing too is, if, even if that's not your family, if somebody in your family homesteaded <coughs> in Western Kansas in the 1870s, that's primary source information that is applicable to other people. They all kind of experience the same drought, the same <laughs> problems, the same prices, and all that sort of thing, transportation issues. But anyway, um, Lynn used Isaac's journal as a basis for her book, The Prairie Bachelor. This book's another one of the most comprehensive sites to reach out to other family historians. Many Facebook groups are private, and you must agree to certain terms and be accepted to join the group. Private groups add a layer of confident confidentiality for people who are reluctant to use social media because of private privacy concerns. <laughs> so local genealogy, history, church, cemetery, family surname groups, etc., are great places to look on Facebook. So if you just do a search on Facebook for maybe a county you'd like you're interested in, you can join something, either a history society, a genealogy society, or a county group or whatever, to get some information there. You can search for relatives you find on Ancestry.com, et cetera, in these places, because a lot of times people use the same name or email address or the same picture, so you can kind of stalk people. <laughs> if you find them on Ancestry, you might be able to find them on Facebook, so you can make contact that way if you can't do it through Ancestry. Um, also, these groups are great to ask questions. Um, before I went to Pennsylvania on a trip, I said, should I fly into Harrisburg or should I fly in Philadelphia or should I go to Allentown? <laughs> they gave me good traffic advice. And then I said, where's a good hotel in Reading? And they gave me good advice. Where are some good restaurants? And, you know, just all that kind of thing. You get some great friendly answers. And I made some good connections that gave me wonderful information on Facebook. However, the best reason to be on Facebook is that I found the best information I've ever found in my life. Here. But anyway, once you uh, join a private group and they allow access to you, you'll get a little spot over here that says join. If it's a public group, it'll say following instead of join. Um, and then within that whole, everything that's ever been posted on that site, you can go to this little search and put a name or a place in there or a topic and see what that where that might have appeared in the entire history of that Facebook page. So I made my most incredible discovery ever immediately after I was accepted into the Berks County Genealogy Facebook group. I was searching for the parents of my great great grandmother, Melinda Werner, who married Israel Lee. I found them in Milton, Northumberland County, but her husband's obituary published in Reading, Pennsylvania, stated he was a former member of, or former resident of Berks County. And I hadn't researched in Berks County at all. So I only had a few scraps of information about the leaves, including a photo of Melinda's family that my aunt shared with me, but I didn't have enough evidence to positively identify her parents, and everybody was named Catherine and Jim. So, <laughs> when she noticed I was accepted into the Berks County group, I typed her maiden name, Werner, into the search box. And imagine my shock when the results brought up a photo of Angelina Werner Bickle and her husband. And I had seen this picture of my great great grandma's family that my aunt gave me. And I thought, oh my gosh, she looks exactly like her, and her name is Werner. <laughs> and uh, Israel has the same style beard and everything as Mr. Bickle. 
So it turned out when I researched Angelina and my great grandmother, great great grandmother Melinda were sisters. They were the only two children of the first, or the only two sisters of the first uh, daughters of the first husband, I should say, or first wife, I should say. And those kind of unusual names, Melinda and Angelina, were kind of unusual. And I was able to then put a whole bunch of lines together. And I had my tree out to right here with Melinda before I joined this group. And then within a few weeks after joining, I had enough information that it one link to all these Germans that all hung out together and they all came over, you know, within a, a few years of one another. And a lot of them came from the same areas too. So that was like my best thing ever. <clears throat> Tagging your location on Facebook when you're on a genealogy research or pleasure trip can also generate unexpected results. My sister and I tagged our location at Zion's Church in Berks County, and she soon received a message from the church office offering to send her a book of church history. She replied that she was actually accompanying me on the family history trip, so they sent us both a book. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something you really can't buy. They have them in their church. They have published this book, and they have them in their church for their, their congregation and families, and they just said it. They even Paid the shipping and everything. I offered to pay for it. They said, Oh no. The book tells about our sixth great grandfather, Johann Conrad Kirschner, who went to Philadelphia to request 40 acres of land from the Penn family to serve as a site to build the first John Zion Blog Church in 1779. <laughs> so they were founding family of the church. The book also contains church history and records from 1760 to 1976, kind of a 200 year book there, and lists of, has lists of church sacraments and members of the congregation, and then also a translation of a German epitaph on Conrad's headstone. And it also has this cemetery map, and the cemetery is huge. I think it has like 27,000 people in it out in the middle of nowhere. But uh, using this and then the descriptions of where the graves are in the alphabetical list. You can see where they are. And it has, um, a lot of times it has a translation, like this says, here rests the body of Conrad Kirshner and so on. So that was very, very wonderful to get that. Okay, also some other features to look at on Facebook, if you're in a group, so a lot of times they'll have media, or files that you can view. The files on this one, I think are PDF and Word files. This one's something about a consignee for a steamboat, something or other. And these are newspaper articles. So there's a whole list of things on a lot of these sites. And then the media would contain usually just pictures. Sometimes it's videos too, but don't forget to look for those things. Find a grave. <laughs> Find a grave is another genealogy website where you may read information beyond dates and places. Always check other possible sources of information on the memorial page. You can look for the source of who created the memorial and also perhaps who contributed different items on the page, who contributed the photos, who left flowers, who maybe left notes or obituaries. And you can contact the manager or the contributor that established or is taking care of the memorial. And you can even request a photo if there isn't one on the page. And probably a lot of you know that, but look at a couple of things you can do. For example, start with view the source. Have any of you ever looked to see who created that? Yeah, that's a good, good place to go. And who added the photos? Another good place to go. <clears throat> you can contact the contributor who added a, added a photo and ask permission to use the photo. Um, you can use it for usually your own personal use. They don't usually want you to publish it or something, but you can find out. And then the source can tell you who established and manages the memorial, as we said. 
And a lot of the contributors, when you put on their name, will have a biography that tells a little bit about them. Sometimes they're your relatives if they're on the same site that you're looking for relatives. I found out that this woman, Harriet, is my sixth cousin, I believe it was. She has her address here for email. And she left a story saying there were three brothers who came to Berks County, the Easter brothers, and Yost or Joseph is my uh, ancestor. But anyway, she has a 1957 article by a German researcher. And you can contact her if you're interested. Of course I did. And she sent this document, which she accessed and translated when she lived in Germany. It's in a book in Elshoff and is protected by German copyright law. So there's no way I would ever have found it. And if I did find it, I wouldn't know how to read it. <laughs> but she's translated it and sent it to me. And it's about um, incorrect information being distributed about, the, I think, the, the mother of those three boys. So anyway, it's really an interesting story. And I have it all, but I'm not supposed to distribute it anywhere because it's copyrighted. <laughs> you can also look for clues or cousins among the member, members who leave a flower on the morning page. You can also leave a, a flower. You can see, you just click on that tab at the top. And again, you can click on the name here. Sometimes they'll even tell you how they're related before you even do that. But you can click on that name and then send an email and ask them how they're related and maybe figure out how you are cousins or if they have information that you don't. And um, this person, it says, has passed away that established this memorial. <laughs> but since he's gone, they did leave a little note here that says you can copy the photos and attach them for your, per for your personal use. So you can get things even when people are no longer living that are maintaining those. Um, this is a good example of information left by a contributor. I contacted him because I found different accounts about how my third great grandfather, Daniel Washington Wooten, died. I contacted this man, Robert Brown, asking for the source of his account of Daniel's death. We know he died going to the gold rush in California, but we don't know really what happened. This account says he drowned when he was mining in the Feather River. Um, I actually ended up getting the Civil War, or, uh, 1812 War, no, that's not right, Indian War <laughs> pension file. And uh, his wife told how he died in that. So I have firsthand information after I saw this. But anyway, I contacted this guy because I wanted to know where he got that information. And it ended up, we exchanged information, and I had some copies of Wooten Bible pages that I shared with him. And he ended up telling me he was writing a book about the fight for Apple River Fort in 1832, which Daniel and his brother were involved in. And he asked permission to mention my name and the acknowledgments in his book because I sent him those Bible pages. So I'm, I'm excited to read the book, but I don't think it's been published yet. Jerry knows how long it takes to publish <laughs> Okay. <laughs> This contributor provided the title of a book recounting the military history of my great great grandfather, Thomas Jefferson Hathaway. This Civil War Union Army Regiment is listed in this book, and it tells a biography about him and the uh, experiences of his unit. And um, I did not contact this man, but it's here. He did give the name of the book, Complete History of the 46th Regiment, blah, blah, blah. So I just Googled that, and it happens to be an online free book. I found this is a front page of the book. This is the story about his company. He ended up commanding his regiment company, company during a battle of Shiloh because his two commanding officers were both taken out for sickness and injury. And so he, he's famous for that. And then it gave a really nice biography about him including he um, is a poultry raiser and lover of fine-blooded varieties. <laughs> and he lives in Iantha, Missouri. So I knew him from Missouri, but uh, two more fine grade chips are always click on the photos and then 
click on view original. That way it expands the size of the photo. And if you want to save it, download it, or print it, you'll get a much better copy. Plus you can see it better too, you can en enlarge it. And if you want a photo, when there isn't a photo, you can take a stab at this. I usually try to find someone who's taken a bunch of pictures in that particular cemetery and email them instead of just requesting photo because it just kind of goes into a dump where anybody can look and can take a picture for you. But if you ask a specific person that seems to frequent that place, I had good luck. <clears throat> Church and cemetery websites are also great places to, uh, at, and on all Facebook pages too, are excellent places to find photos and facts about the history of the church. And most of them can be found with a Google of the church name and location. Those sections in uh, the websites might tell you about the history of the church. Sometimes they list founders or ministers, whole list of who's been a minister for many, many years. They may have historic photos or links to church records at their location or another site. And they may have burial lists or cemetery map. You can also contact the church office or minister for answers to questions you have if there really isn't anything on the site. Um, before going on a genealogy trip, I always research the churches or cemeteries that I plan to visit. This is uh, often, there's often history on the website, as I said. So we can see here that this Burn Reformed Church in Berks County has history, several different uh, types of categories. Mm -hmm. And down at the bottom of the history, it has graveyard records. So I use this index to get ready to go on my trip. You have the index and then you go back to whatever row they're on to find a description. So this is the map of the cemetery, <laughs> which was sort of helpful. <laughs> you know, <laughs> then there's a whole list of alphabetical names and then they cross-reference that back to the row. The rows are lettered and the stones are numerically numbered on the rows. And within these squiggly rows, then you're supposed to be able to find your ancestor. Um, we finally did. <laughs> we did. But um, another thing is sometimes you can use um, find your grave pictures to help you find a stone when you're looking for somebody in a big cemetery. That didn't work here. You can pull a collect. But we were armed with the row and with the number. We knew he was a Revolutionary War veteran, and there were several of them, but you can also look for like markers for military headstones that will help you. But we found Thomas, it was hard, but um, we didn't know what it said, but there was a translation on that site too. So we got to visit Thomas and some other people there. <clears throat> Friends Evangelical Lutheran Church in Burnville doesn't have a website, but it does have a Facebook page. I learned on Ancestry that the church contains a stained glass window as a memorial to my sixth great grandfather, Gottfried Fiddler Jr., who donated land to help establish the church in 1745. <clears throat> I watched their Easter church service video online during COVID shutdown, hoping to catch a glimpse of the window, but there was no luck on that. <laughs> so I decided to leave a comment about my family's connection to Freedom's Church. And I mentioned that I'd like to have a photo of the, the window. The pastor took pictures of the window and sent them to me the next day, which was really cool. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Says, yeah, it's a fairly new church, but this is dedicated to Gottfried. And I contacted the church later. Oops, I went too far. Uh, contacted them about a year later and asked if I could go and somehow get in the church to see the window. So a lady on Facebook that is a member of the church arranged for some ladies that were serving a lunch, like, like they did a lunch for poor people in the community, or kind of like we did around here, I'm not necessarily poor, but a free lunch for people. And they were there the day that we, we set our schedule, so we would get there and they let us walk in and look at the church and gave us a chore. And I know why we didn't see the 
stained glass window in the video because there's probably 35 stained glass windows but everywhere is so really beautiful. Okay, we're getting close. <laughs> Uh, genealogical or historical society websites or library websites are also a great place to look for information and to ask questions. Uh, some of them sell publications, just like QGS does. We sell our local publications. We, uh, they may provide links to other resources or have online catalogs, materials, and a lot of them have members who do research or lookups for you. And they likely have members who are experts in local family history and genealogy. So just as an example, I uh, read that my seventh great grandfather got three senior seniors cabin built in the 1730s, still stood near Copiahawken Creek in Berks County. This is the stained glass window that I father. <laughs> I hope to see this in person when I went to Pennsylvania, but I didn't know if it was still standing because this post was pretty old. So I wrote to the Tolkien Settlement Historical Society and received an answer from John Grimes. He said he found out from a 98-year-old man in the community that the cabin was still in good condition, but no visitors were allowed. And it doesn't look like it's a 1730 cabin or whatever, but the logs are underneath all of that and they built stuff over it. So it's, I think the logs are, are visible in the back or something. But anyway, a year later, I contacted some other people asking about the Lurch family in the same county, and another researcher pointed me to John's book. He wrote a book about the Lurch family. So it ended up that a year later, I talked to the same guy again. <laughs> He's my seventh cousin, and um, he met my sister and me at this library and took us on a tour of where all the houses used to be or where the land was when we were you know, back here in the 1700s. Because he knew where all this stuff was. That was pretty cool. Um, the same society has a fabulous website with a catalog of holdings and a large assortment of publications and used books for sale. Um, a lot of their journals are like $2. And they have specific stories about people that were members of my family in the far way back ancestry. Um, and you can look through this huge catalog of information. They also have a, a catalog of holdings. And you can find it real easily on their homepage. You just go to inventory of the library. There are eight, can't see it, 813 pages of catalog materials. And you can search those by hitting control F and then typing in a keyword up here. So I typed in Lurch and found that there was a deed in their holdings that was signed by John Lurch and Nicholas Lieb. Those were my three times great grand uncles, both of them, they were close to each other. And I got to see that actual deed when I went there. So it was wonderful. Most big libraries also have sections for genealogy on their website and, cat and in their catalog. Uh, ones like Genealogy Center at Allen County, Indiana, St. Louis County Library, Midwest Genealogy Center, Dallas Public Library, and lots more have a lot of helpful resources. So just take, take a look and see what they have, especially if somebody lived in that area in your family. Uh, the St. Louis County Library has a free link to History Geo, which is a subscription service which maps original landowners in federal land states. It usually costs money, but there's a link on their site that says History Geo provides a searchable database of 12.3 million names connected to land ownership maps covering 29 public land states and Texas. Uh, the database also features a historical map collection. Uh, so you can sign into that. I gave instructions on a handout. You can look up your ancestors that might have bought land from the federal government. And I put the link on where you can look for an index of those two. Ancestry, family tree, hence some of another one. <laughs> uh, look for well-sourced family trees if you see them in the hints. Be cautious because things aren't always right. Make sure you verify things with documents before you copy them. And then notice when you click on tree hints that you get different information if you click on the tree or if you click on the member. Also look over the gallery or all photos if you're looking for something like that, or you can contact DNA matches. 
And you can do a member search for people by name. Uh, they might use the real name, they might not, but you can give it a shot and kind of go over this a little bit. Um, when you see a tree hint, it usually tells you the family tree, the person who owns it, and then whatever person you're looking for. <clears throat> if you click on the member or the owner of the tree, you just get biographical information about the person, uh, when they last signed in, if you're a DNA match, and a place that you can message them. So if you click on that, you may think, oh, there's nothing really there. But instead, if you clicked on either that family tree or the person's <coughs> name, you're going to get sent to their person page. And then from that, you can look at the entire family tree if you'd like to. And you can also, of course, go across and do all three of these places. The gallery is a place that you can see all the attachments to him that might be pictures or other information that are not in that facts category. Um, for example, um, here's one where if you click on that, you can see the media gallery. It's a huge, huge, usually a huge display of all the media posted for the entire tree. And you can sort that and filter it by pictures or dates or names. Um, and they also have a stool in this category, I think it is. Almost done. Um, this one, I wanted to know who posted that picture. So I clicked on the owner or that person who had put that on there. He just says FDR 106. I didn't know who that was. So I clicked on that. And found out about him, and I did send him a message. It turned out he is a relative, and he took the picture. Um, I also wanted to know where this picture came from, so I clicked on this lady's uh, name and contacted her, and she told me that she actually owns that photo, so I know it's for real. Sometimes people put photos on there, and they don't they don't know what they're doing, and it's wrong. But if you go to the original poster, uh, let me go back and show. Yeah. You probably already know this. Go to where the original post is done. And people can still fool you with that because they can copy them and then post them. But usually you can find the, the um, origination. Okay. Uh, Gen Web is also good. I'm going to have to stop, but um, <laughs> Gen Web is a great place to go. Look for that. Uh, you filter it down to state and then county. Uh, this one's wonderful. It's from Jasper County, Iowa. It has funeral home data. So I looked for my third great grandfather. I knew he died in Colfax. We have two Colfax funeral homes. So I checked those out. And uh, they had a list of uh, a alphabetical list. I found Mr. Groom. It said he died of heart failure and all that. I knew that, but this is not the original record. So I ended up asking a man at the Jasper County Genealogical Library when I went there, you know, it's not very far away, and he went upstairs in the attic and got for me the original funeral home book that says my third great grandpa had a six-foot coffin that cost $35. He had a robe that cost $5. His embalming in attendance was 10. The grave was four. Purse was 10, so the whole cost for his funeral was $64. <laughs> I'm probably going to have to quit. This, this was just saying that um, I uh, took an email address that I found from 2000 and thought, oh, that's, nobody's going to answer that because it was 2019. But the guy did answer me. And then I found a, a newspaper story from 2015 about this article. So I Googled this guy that contributed this deed to a library. And he answered I had the right person. And then he gave me a lot of information. And I was able to go to that library and see that deed, which was more fun. And that's enough for the day. <laughs> Does anybody have questions? Uh, yeah. On uh, family search, the book, um, 
because not of all of them are public, some of them are private. Now, with private books, um, so sometimes you can go to a big hotbed in uh, independent or go to one of the famous church, uh, churches. Are they available here? What I do is I look for them on World Cat. And then I try to find one that I can get from Pinker Library alone. And is it the Pika and then you Yep, I get it. Yeah, I used to charge a dollar for getting the book. I know they're during COVID, they, they uh, waived that fee, but they probably, you know, I know you can still get them. You can't always get everything, right. but you can get a lot in your library alone. But I just Google and pick and stuff. Okay. <laughs> My granddaughter did that, and I was like, Google it. Yeah. We found, you know, she took us back a couple hundred generations. You're like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Google is good if you have very strategic searches. So I would study how to strategically use Google for searches. And yeah, I was just not that you do that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm with too long. That's okay. Thank you very much. Very